Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search, brought to you by VIP. I'm your host, Casey Haston, Executive Recruiter, Director of Recruiting with VIP, and your all-around hiring guru. And today, I am super excited about the guest that I have with us, so let me tell you a little bit more about him, and then we'll jump right into the meat of what he has to share with us today. So today with me, I have Brian Ahern, Chief Influence Officer of Influence People, all in caps. We'll talk about that later. He is one of the only 20 individuals in the world, in the world, who has been Um, who currently holds the Cialdini Method Certified Trainer designation, a specialization in the psychology of persuasion. Brian's blog has readers in more than 200 countries, and his book, Influence People, Powerful Everyday Opportunities to Persuade That Are Lasting and Ethical, was named one of the top 100 influence books of all times by Book Authority. Wow. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> Brian's passion is to help you achieve greater professional success and enjoy more personal happiness by learning how to ethically move others to action using the science of influence. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time. Well, I appreciate the offer to be on KC to get to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Well, I can see why it is. And I am almost finished. I think I've got one more chapter left. I'm listening to the book. And I have to tell you, I told you I had a story to tell you before we got on here. But I was listening to a conversation, a sales conversation in the office today. And the person who I will not name was trying to sell some of our services. And they were saying, but we can come in cheaper than the other people. And I went, no, less than expensive, you know, (laughs) because we don't want to be seen as cheap which is a principle in the book. So um, so tell me a little bit about PEOPLE, the, the acronym that you have. Okay. Well, when I talk about influence, it's all about people. And it was many years ago. I don't remember how it was that I came up with it, but it hit me that PEOPLE is a great acronym for powerful, everyday opportunities to persuade that are lasting and ethical. And that really is kind of foundational to uh, what I share with people. You know, it's powerful because it's based on research. It's a skill that we use every single day. There are opportunities out there right now that most people probably don't see because they don't understand the language of persuasion. We talk about what it means to persuade and moving people to action. If we do it well, it can have a lasting impact. And then overarching all of that is we have to do it ethically. I love that because, you know, I'm in sales as well. Basically, I just, people are my product. Um, And I think that it is so important that we use that ethical persuasion and not manipulation. So, um, but as far as, you know, your influence with using your people acronym and how how do you use that to serve others? Because I believe you have a coaching practice too, right? Yeah, pretty much anything around the science of influence or the psychology of persuasion whether it's speaking, training, coaching, consulting, uh, all of those things. If somebody says, you know, I want you to come in and and train my team, I do that. Uh, I speak at conferences. If they say, uh, I just want to want coaching, I do a lot of that. And some portions say what I really want is just consulting. Just come in and tell me what to do and where to do it. So, So all of those, but it's all about the application of the psychology of persuasion. Gotcha. So how has it helped you personally in your career? Well, it is my job. So (laughs) when I I came across uh, Cialdini, it was in the early 2000s. A co-worker gave a video to my boss and I. He said, I think you like this. I was working in the sales department, and my responsibility was to do sales training for our field associates, the individuals who would go out and visit the insurance agents. So when I saw him presenting at Stanford, the light bulb came on. I thought, holy cow, this is all the psychology that underlies selling. I mean, right away, I recognized that. I loved his stance on ethics, and I also loved the fact that it was research-based. 
This wasn't somebody giving you their good advice or their theory. It was backed up by actual data from studies decades worth in social psychology. So, and I think you told me a story about how you got Robert Cialdini's attention. Well, it, it had to do with the ethical part. So as I said, I was drawn to the, to the ethical part because I, I believe we should do right by people and, and treat them in ways that they want to be treated. And what was interesting, he was presenting at Stanford. And so I signed up for some of Stanford's marketing and they had all kinds of other great resources. And one day, one of their marketing flyers comes across my desk. And as I'm flipping through it, looking at it, there's his picture. And in bold letters, it says bestseller. And then right underneath that, it says, call it influence, persuasion, or even manipulation. And I thought, I can't believe they actually use that word. I mean, he was introduced in a way where they said non-manipulative ways to move people to action. He talked about non-manipulative ways. So I thought, well, first of all, the copywriter didn't watch the video. But second, what good copywriter would think that the word manipulation would help sales? So I sent an email to Stanford and I basically said, I don't know anybody who's looking to become a good manipulator. And I don't know anybody who is who wants to be manipulated. That word cannot be helping your sales, but it really could be hurting. And I never heard from Stanford, but sometime later my phone rang at work and it was a representative from Robert Cialdini's organization, Influence at Work. And she said, I'm calling to thank you on behalf of Dr. Cialdini. You sent an email to Stanford and because of that email, they're changing the marketing of all of our materials. And I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. And we had a nice conversation. And at some point in the conversation, she said, you know, if your company is ever looking for a guest speaker, he travels the world and talks about this. And I said, well, I sit next to the woman who books our events and speaking engagements. Would you like to talk with her? And as fate would have it, it was the summer of 2004. And he was in Columbus, Ohio, several times to talk to the insurance agents that represented our company. Wow. And Robert Cialdini, just for those of, those of us who may not be aware of him, he is, and I'm going to let you say what his, he's like one of the most noted or he's the number one. He's the most cited living social psychologist in the world when it comes to this specific topic, the science of influence. Um, he wrote a book back in the mid 80s called Influence, Science and Practice. And it really didn't do that well when it first came out, but it started to gain traction. And in the late 90s, early 2000s, I think a lot of people started to realize, like I did, wow, this is foundational to selling. If I understand this psychology, my ability to sell will be much, much greater. And all of a sudden, it just took off. And, uh, and now he, he's kind of the godfather of, of influence. There's no better resource on the market than reading that book as the foundation for understanding this. I'm going to have to go get that book next now that, but, and I think to your credit, you know, and, you know, he accepted you under his wing and taught you his practices so that you could become one of the 20 people in the world certified. Um, but he also wrote an endorsement in your book. Yeah, he, he was very generous in, in his praise. Um, my book is all about the practical application of the psychology. I'm not a social psychologist or a behavioral economist. Uh, I, I don't intend to be, but I love reading and learning about this and then helping people apply it so they can enjoy more success at the office and happiness at home. And I, I say happiness at home because I, I've found being, being married more than 30 years and, and having a daughter in her mid twenties, life at home tends to be a little more peaceful and happy when those around us more willingly say yes. I like that. I'm going to have to try that at home and see if it works. Instead of saying, you shall use a little bit more persuasion with everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, anytime you want somebody to do something, that's a persuasive conversation. And if you understand how people think and behave and you're willing to change how you communicate, it's amazing the difference it can make. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I was so grateful that I had just read your book because I did, even though I'm going to have to go back and read it again, because there's a lot of information in there. There's no way you can absorb it all the first time through. But I had to have a conversation today and I believe, and it was a very, very successful conversation. And I believe it's because I was already starting to apply some of those principles of persuasion. Yeah. So well, thank that, you. That's me. I, oh, you're welcome. I, I love hearing it. I love it when I get messages on LinkedIn, emails, and people say, I tried what you what you shared in the book or what you taught and it works and they're just so excited. Yeah, and it makes sense the way you just break it down. Like now, even after one run through, I'm looking through advertising a totally different way. 
just a totally different way. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, I always tell people when, when I talk about those opportunities, I, I use an analogy quite often about buying a new car. Um, most people, when they buy their new car in the days and weeks after they make the purchase, they feel like they see their car everywhere on the road. But it's really that their awareness has just been raised. When people begin to learn about the psychology and these principles, they're amazed at how often they start seeing marketers, advertisers, salespeople, politicians, how they're all trying to get them to do things. But more importantly, it's it's for them to understand so they can communicate in a way where more people say yes to them. And, and I'm a firm believer, you know, in the success part of this, I always talk about professional success and personal happiness. You know, when you're at work, if you're in sales, you know you need to get people to say yes. Mm -hmm. If you're a, a middle manager with a great idea, you need somebody above you to say yes. Even if you're the person leading the organization, you still got to get everybody on board and saying yes to your initiative. So it is critical for your professional success. I love that. So let's kind of switch this to the candidate perspective. So, you know, I'm, I work with candidates to help them find jobs, right? And I know that the interview is the most important time to make an impression on the hiring manager, right? And so I coach heavily around that. But how can a job candidate strengthen their persuasion persuasion, sorry, I can't talk, persuasion skills to make a greater impact during the interview? Well, they need to understand what that psychology is and, and how to apply it so that they can build relationships, overcome the uncertainty, right? Is this the right candidate to choose? And also how to sell themselves. You know, what is it that makes them unique? There's a principle we talk about called scarcity. We all want things more when we think they're rare or going away. When a candidate is trying to sell himself or herself to a potential employer, they need to be able to talk to them about themselves in a way that really conveys to that employer, like, if we don't choose him or her, we're going to miss out on something. And I would give a, like, a personal example for me. Uh, I work a lot with salespeople. There are tons of sales trainers. But for the niche that I go after, which is primarily insurance, I'm the only person in that whole industry that's certified by Dr. Cialdini. So I can legitimately say, if you don't go with what I'm doing here, you can't find anybody else who will teach you this specific psychology and can apply it to the insurance processes, be it sales claims, underwriting. And so that's what makes me unique. Candidates need to be able to talk about themselves in that way so that that potential employer just feels like we got to hire him or her or else we're going to really be missing out on something. That is Amazing. And I believe another one of your principles is, is is authority, setting yourself up as the expert, like you just did right there. That was a very good example of that. But I think it's important that candidates who have that extra, you know, and this is very basic, but if you, if you have your CPA certification, that sets you up as a person in, of authority. You have taken the test and been granted, you're crowned, that you have the right to say, no, you can't do that in accounting, right? Yes. And and certainly the employer is going to know that going into the interview. They're going to have a resume. They're going to have looked at LinkedIn. But it never hurts to mention that during an interview. If you were interviewing me and I was a CPA and you asked a question and I said, you know, Casey, that's a great question. I remember when I was studying for my CPA exam and I begin to talk about that, that brings that right to the forefront for you. And all of a sudden it begins to change your thinking. It's not bragging, it's truthful, it's conversational. And these are the kind of things that people need to understand to weave into the, the communication that they typically have so that it's a very natural conversation. And, and again, I want to go back to what you said. It's ethical persuasion. You know, yes, you are, you're triggering the, them to think what you want them to think about, but in a very ethical and non-manipulative way. Yeah, I mean, everything I just said there was true. When I talked about I'm one of 20, the only person in the insurance industry, all, all of that is true. And as long as we're being truthful like that, we should feel comfortable about what it is that we're sharing. That is such good information. Um, so I want to talk about one of your principles in, uh, in particular, and that's the principle of consistency. Um, how can the consistency help a candidate use their persuasion skills on their resume, um, LinkedIn, or elsewhere? How, how does that show up? Well, consistency really, when we're talking about persuasion, consistency is about the other person. So for example, um, consistency would come into play when I learn things about you, Casey, 
And if I can, you know, if I understand what you value, what you've said in the past, what you've done, most people act in a consistent manner. And if I can line up what I'm asking with what you've said, what you've done, what you believe, it makes it easier for you to say yes. So in an interview process, it would be really important for a candidate to understand if they can, the individual that they're talking with, uh, but certainly the organization, because if they can line up what, if they can line up who they are and what they bring to the table with the values of the organization, the direction of the organization, what that organization holds dear and, and believes, it makes it easier for that person who represents the organization to say, this is probably the right candidate. So that's where consistency would come into play. Now, another application of consistency, which a lot of people, and, and I think you were maybe getting at is, how can I personally, how can my personal consistency make an impact? Um, when you are personally consistent, you always do what you say, you turn in good work all the time, that really adds to your authority. You become that dependable person that they can go to. Um, and certainly, doing things in a consistent manner will portray that. So uh, you mentioned LinkedIn. If you are consistently posting on LinkedIn, consistently commenting, and people see that, that's an opportunity for you to build your credibility as an authority. Absolutely. And also, I mean, do you, would this fall under consistency? Um, like, you know, the information, if I'm the candidate, the information that I have on my resume compared to the information that I have on LinkedIn or, you know, anywhere or answers that I give in the interview, would that fall under that consistency principle as well? Oh, absolutely. You, you want to be consistent in, in how you're advertising yourself and what you're talking about is important. Certainly, if I were in an interview with you and you said, Brian, you know, what are three things that are really important to you? And I tell you ABC, and then the next recruiter asks me a question and I say XYZ, you guys get in your integration meeting and, and you're not going to see me as consistent because I'm giving you different answers to the same question. So yeah, I, I think that part is, is very important. And consistency, again, it goes back to that reliability. You want to know that I can rely on that individual. Got it. So I know we've kind of touched on this, but I really want to have this like black and white. So what is the difference between manipulation and ethical persuasion? Okay, that's a great question. That, and that comes up a lot. And, and that's always a starting point because I like to start with that because I don't want somebody to, the whole time we're talking, think that this is manipulation. When we talk about ethical influence, there's three things that have to happen. First, we have to be truthful. And when I say truthful, we, we tell the truth and we don't hide the truth. Um, a candidate who knows they have a shortcoming and tries to hide it, once that comes to the surface, they're going to lose credibility. Mm -hmm. But what we find in, in influence is you can talk about shortcomings. And if you address them early on, you gain credibility as being truthful. And you have an opportunity to segue with a word like but or however into what your strengths are. And usually people forget what comes before but. So by talking a little bit about your shortcoming and transferring over to those strengths, that's what people remember. So that's the first part of uh, being ethical. We've got to be truthful in what we do and we don't hide it. The second thing that we do is we only use the principles that are natural to the situation. So if there's really no scarcity, then you don't try to manufacture scarcity. An example that I'm sure your listeners would understand is that person who knocks on their door at their home and tries to sell them gutter, siding, roofing, something like that, and uses the tired, worn out line, Casey, if you sign today, I can save you 15%, but if I have to come back tomorrow, I can't give you that deal. That's false scarcity. There's really nothing scarce. There's no reason that salesperson couldn't come back tomorrow and give you the same deal. True scarcity might be, um, you know, Casey, there's a, a hurricane that's coming up the Gulf. And if it hits, there could be a shortage of roofing supplies. I can't guarantee this price uh, after today. That's, that's truthful because you know that there is a storm coming and supplies could be short. So we, we tell the truth. We only use principles that are natural to the situation. And then the, the third thing is creating win-win situations. I like to say, good for you, good for me, then we're good to go. 
if if we're both benefiting from this, then we can feel good about that transaction. So those are the three components. If we can have all three of those, we should be able to look ourselves in the mirror and feel good about how we're interacting with other people. I love that you just said that because one of my mentors taught me that a long, long time ago when I first started, you know, in the professional world. And he told me, he goes, as long as you can look at yourself in the mirror, when you get up in the morning, you're doing okay. <laughs> I was like, just kidding. That's right. <laughs> and, and again, I, this does give you um, a significant advantage when you understand how people think and behave and other people may not. So you, in a sense, you have more power and you have to be, you have to exercise that with care. Most of us are in um, business where relationships matter, and we don't ever want to damage those because upset people will tell a lot more people about the experience than will yeah. happy people. And so we always need to be considering um, doing right by other people. The other thing I'll say about manipulation is this. When people really lay hold of the principle of liking, you know, the, it, we all know this, it's easier to say yes to people that we know and like, but that principle is not so much about me getting you, KC, to like me. It's about me coming to like you. And the, the beauty in that is I would never manipulate my friends. So the more I come to know and like you, the, the less that is ever even a temptation. And the good thing is the more you see how much I know and like you, well, you also believe friends do right by friends and you become much more open to whatever I might be putting on the table for you. I won't always know exactly what you want or need, but at least you receive it in a way where you say, you know what, Brian has my best interest at heart. And the good news is I really do. And so we have this, this very positive, virtuous cycle by me focusing on coming to like you. You know, I've never really looked at it that way before. That is so interesting. I'm going to start. But I, but I do know that I am just speaking to that as a recruiter, that if I'm not 100% on board with a candidate, if I don't like mm -hmm. them, then I'm less likely to be their champion with the client because I don't feel good about putting my name on them. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we all know this when we're going to buy something. If two people put essentially the same product and price on the table and one person we know, like, and trust, and the other we do, don't really know, we won't say we distrust them, but we don't have trust yet, we're going to go with the person we know, like, and trust every time. And when you're recruiting, it's going to be the same thing. If two candidates have essentially the same skill set and experience and one of them you like, wow, I just really like him or her, not sure what it is, but I really do, mm -hmm. you're going to assume the rest of the company is going to probably like them too. And that person's going to get the nod. So it's not always the it's not always the person who is going to have the, the skill set necessarily, because quite often that's even. It's the person who's going to be the most likable. Exactly. I love that you have a quote in your book from Jeffrey Gittimer. Um, you know, he's, I, I've been stalking him for a while. I haven't got him yet, but I'm getting close. I've gotten an email introduction. So, um, but, but I love his style, his little, his 12 and a half, is it 12 and a half or 13 and a half? Principles of selling. Anyway, his little red book. Um, it's really, really good. And I love his philosophy, but do you, do you remember that quote in the book? Yeah, uh, all things being equal, people prefer to do business with their friends. All things being not so equal, people still prefer to do business yep. with their friends. That really, you know, th these principles that we talk about, um, smart people who pay attention, they understand it. They may not always be able to define it, but, but he clearly learned through the course of his career that, yeah, I'm always going to do business and most people will do business with the person that they like. And depending on the depth of the relationship, you might be willing to pay 5, 10, maybe 15% more to the person that you know, like, and trust because you feel more confident in the product or service based on that relationship. Absolutely. So what are some of the common mistakes people make when, it, when trying to influence others? Well, one common mistake is talking about that principle of liking, focusing too much on trying to get the other person to like them. And, and then you can come across like a used car salesman who might say or do anything just to make the sale. Much, much better to go into situations and say, how can I come to like the person, this person, the people that I serve, the people that I work with, the vendors that we deal with? How can I come to like them? You will get far more traction out of that and you will enjoy what you do so much more because you'll be able to look at people and say, you know what? I really like everybody that I work with. 
and it starts with me. It starts with you. It starts with the decision every one of us makes. So I'd say that's one of the mistakes. The other one is um, going back to that principle of consistency. Um, consistency says that we feel this internal psychological pressure, but also an external social pressure to be consistent in what we say and what we do. Um, most people, they get that, but they don't tap into the principle because they spend too much time telling people what to do. When I tell you what to do, Casey, you might not have heard me. You might have in your heart said, I don't care, I'm not gonna do it. You, you may have a whole host of reasons for not doing what I just told you to do. But if I ask you, if I say, Casey, would you, and you come back and say yes, you now you've triggered that internal psychological pressure. First and foremost, you don't wanna feel bad about yourself about saying one thing and doing another, but you also don't wanna look bad in my eyes or anybody else who might've heard you make that commitment. So I always tell people, stop telling, start asking. When you move away from telling people what to do and start asking, you will have lots more people actually doing what you want because they just don't wanna feel bad about themselves. Would you say, would another way to uh, rephrase that would be you're creating buy-in by asking? Yes, uh, Tom Hopkins, pretty well-known sales trainer. I love the way he puts it. When you say it, they doubt it, but when they say it, they believe it. So by me asking you the right questions and you surfacing something, well, you own that because it came from you. But if I tell you, and especially in, in sales, if I tell you how great a product is, you may believe it, you may not. But if I get you to say, isn't this a great product? Now you want it. That is fabulous. I'm so going to try that with my next, next time I'm trying to get a candidate hired. Let me, let me give you this example. Steve Jobs, when he introduced uh, the, the iPod, the first generation, and, and he pulled it out of his pocket and he said a thousand songs in your pocket. And, and he didn't say, you know, four gig, five gig. Everybody could relate to a thousand songs, my whole CD collection at the time. And then he said, isn't this amazing? And, and that's a question. And when he said, isn't this amazing? Everybody's answering in their head. And when they're going, that's amazing, then they're buying. But if he's just telling them, I think this is amazing. Well, that's his opinion. So the subtlety of, isn't this amazing? And their heads start going like this. And, and we know what a huge phenomenon the iPod was. And it was a great product, too. You've got to have a great product. Absolutely. Um, so I've got time for one more question. And I'm trying to decide which one I want to ask you. But um, let's... So is influence a trait only leaders should possess? And we kind of touched on this earlier. But... How can those that are in supporting roles utilize their influence to grow? Okay. Uh, it is not a skill just for leaders. It is a skill for every human being on the planet. Because I like to say from womb to tomb, we are always trying to get people to do things. A baby comes out and it cries. We're not sure. Is it, is it tired, hungry? Does it need burped, fed, changed? But it, it has a need it tries to get met. And through the whole of our life, whether we're at work or at home, we are trying to get people to do things. So everybody needs to do it. Um, it's hugely important for everybody in business because you're not going to ascend up the ladder unless you can produce results. And so many of the results that we need to produce are dependent on working together. If I am especially skilled at getting people to say yes to me, I probably complete more projects, do them on time, and there's all kinds of benefit to that. I'm probably the one who's rising in the corporation versus the person who can never seem to get anybody to buy in and do what they want. So hugely important beyond just leaders. That is such a great answer. So I just want to... The name of the book, again, is Influence People. So I highly encourage you to go get this book, read it, devour it, study it, because it has literally already changed the way that I talk to people and I just read it. So I really appreciate that. But um, we are down to our VIP questions. We ask all our guests these questions because we love to see what creative answers you come up with or different answers. I actually had somebody decline to go the other day on one of these and you'll understand here in a second. So are you ready for the VIP questions? I am ready for the VIP questions. Awesome. So if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, what three things or people would you take with you? Um, I would take my wife. 
um, because I always say anything I do is better when she's around. It doesn't Aww. matter what I'm doing, it's better when she's around. Um, I would probably take my iPad because I could load it up with books or other things. Um, I really enjoy learning. And so I would just load that thing to the hilt before we took off. And I would bring some kind of exercise equipment. I, I have always been into fitness uh, since I was a teenager. And so I, I would wanna make sure I'm staying physically active. Those are really good. That's the first time I've gotten uh, workout equipment. So good for you. Kudos on that one. Um, if your life's work was, oh, no, I'm skipping ahead. Let's do this one first. What is one thing you do each morning to set your day up for success? I work out. I'm, I'm up um, very early. And the first thing I do after I get my coffee and kind of wake up a little bit, uh, I've got a really, really nice gym in, in my basement. And I'll get on the treadmill and and run and stretch. And uh, because of COVID and the lockdown, what I do then, I go back in the uh, late afternoon, early evening, and I, and I actually lift. So, but I've done, I've done the morning workout routine for almost 30 years. Wow. That's consistency. That, that is. I, I learned a long time ago. <laughs> uh, a, a little bit over a long period is much better than a whole lot for a short time yep. when it comes to success. I like that too. You're just dropping little knowledge nuggets all over the place. This is good. Um, so my final question for you, if your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? I think it would be well done. I, I, I read um, Stephen Covey's book, uh, Seven Habits, a long time ago, probably more than 25 years ago, and probably one of the few people who actually took this action, but I wrote the personal mission statement that he talked about. I thought it made so much sense. And it's something that for 25 years, almost every single day I've looked at or parts of it, it's actually the screensaver on my phone. And, and the overarching thing that I have in there that I said, you know, when I die, what, I, what do I want people to remember? When I die, I want to hear God say, well done. That, so that is awesome. And I think that's part, or no, you say whenever you're in your signature line, you say, I do things or done well. Well, yeah, when I when I went through some personal branding, when I worked for the insurance company that I worked for for a long time, somebody put on a personal branding class and really got to understand the importance of that. And, and as I thought about it, I, I thought, well, that's going to be my tagline. And, and for a long time at work, it, on every email, it would say when it needs to be done well. Or if somebody called my, my voicemail and they heard me, I'd say, you know, hi, this is, or I'd say, uh, do you need something done well? You've come to the right place. Hi, this is Brian. I'm not at my desk right now. Um, and, and I really saw a huge benefit in that because people would say, ha, 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 I need something done well. But I knew I had them thinking the way that I wanted. And I wanted them, I wanted to build a reputation that I, anything that they gave me to do, I was going to do well. And that was my personal brand until I morphed over to the influence people. And, and now it's helping you hear yes. That is just so amazing. I may have to help you or get you to help me with my voicemail so that I come up with something creative and a little tagline. Right. So let's connect, let's connect after this. I, I will help you because I, I saw a huge benefit from it. I mean, I really did see big benefit from it. That is great. Well, Brian, we are out of time. And so I just have one last thing to say to you. Okay. You are a VIP. Thank you. I appreciate that. And that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.